Hello everyone, um, welcome to the third of our daily webinars um, from Invasive Species Week. Um, so I've just come straight out of another one. Um, but yeah, very pleased to have Stan Whisker here today from Nature Scott. Um, just before we get started, I'm going to go through a few quick housekeeping things and then I'll hand over to Stan um, for our talk today. Uh, so just to make you aware, we're recording the webinar. Um, so if you have any problems um, with sound or anything, you can't see things, you'll be able to see it um, afterwards and we'll share the link so that um, anyone who couldn't attend um, can watch it back. Uh, if you do, yeah, if you are having any problems with sound or things like that, um, it's probably best to try leaving and rejoining. Um, sometimes that works, but if it doesn't, then you'll be able to see it afterwards. Uh, and we'll have some time for questions after the talk. So if you can just add these into the chat box of the Q&A, um, we'll go through those at the end. Um, yeah, I think that's everything that I wanted to say. So yeah, very pleased to introduce Stan Whitaker. Um, and I will hand over to you, Stan. Thank you, Lucy. Uh, while I share my screen, uh, I will just say that I'm the uh, Invasive Non-Native Species uh, Manager at Nature Scott. Um, uh, Nature Scott's the lead organisation advising on uh, invasive non-native species in Scotland. Um, and this doesn't necessarily mean that the work on the ground ourselves, land managers, third party delivery bodies carry out most of the ends work in Scotland. Um, in 2013, the Scottish Biodiversity Strategy said that our top priorities for ends were to identify how these species invade and act quickly to prevent their establishment and spread. So I'm going to talk today about why this is still important and how we prioritise our efforts in Scotland. Uh, to start with, I need to say that I'm not presenting my own work. Uh, the first part of this presentation draws heavily on the IPBES report on invasive alien species, and the second on the horizon scanning and pathways analysis report that UKCH has produced for the Scottish Government. Uh, Biological invasions are a major direct driver of change, including local and uh, global species extinctions. Inns have contributed to 60% of recorded global extinctions, of which 90% occur on islands. Uh, Inns continue to spread and increase in terrestrial freshwater and marine uh, environments across Scotland, and the threat is likely to increase with climate change. Inns are a major threat to globally significant populations of seabirds. Uh, Scotland's rainforest, red squirrel, water vole, Atlantic salmon, to name just a few. The economy, food security and water security and human health are also profoundly affected by INS. Uh, the global economic cost of biological invasions has increased fourfold every decade. Um, the annual estimated cost to the Scottish economy has doubled in the last uh, decade to uh, 499 million a year. Uh, INS can act as vectors of infectious diseases that can uh, lead to ep epidemics such as dengue fever and Zika virus. Thins can add to marginal, mar, marginalisation and inequity and loss of traditional livelihoods and knowledge, especially in developing countries. The threat from invasive alien species are increasing markedly in all regions of Earth. Uh, panel A shows that Europe and its surrounding seas have already some of the highest numbers of established inns. Panel B shows that across different taxa, the number of established non-native species is rising globally at unprecedented and increasing rates. This is primarily influenced by economic drivers, especially the expansion of global trade and travel. There are already uh, more than uh, 2,000 non-native species established in Great Britain and around 12 new uh, non-native species established each year. Establishment and spread of inns are accelerated by other direct drivers such as changes in land and sea use. The good news is that number, the number and impact of INS can be reduced through management of biological invasions. Uh, panel A shows that the generalised invasion curve without management and the expected changes in trajectory of invasion curve with appropriate management actions. So in terrestrial enclosed water systems, including small water bodies and wetlands, 
and marine and connected water systems, including rivers. Uh, prevention and preparedness before ins are introduced are the most cost effective op options. Early detection and eradication can be successful, especially for small and slow spreading populations of inns in isolated ecosystems. Containment and control of established inns can be cost effective on terrestrial and some closed water systems. However, in marine and connected water systems, the window of opportunity to intervention is usually very short. The trick is to remove new invaders as soon as they arrive, or better still, take preventative action to stop them arriving in the first place. We need to know which inns are likely to become established in Scotland and then identify their means and route for invasion. Therefore, the Scottish Government commissioned UKCH, uh, that's the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, to carry out a horizon scanning exercise and prioritise pathways of introduction and spread. The horizon scanning exercise built on Helen Roy's methodology use, uh, used for Great Britain and the UK overseas territories. Uh, preliminary lists of species were compiled for the long list of horizon scanning species for Great Britain and the GB non-native species information portal, also known as the MSIP database. The list comprised of species that were absent in the wild in Scotland, invasive in similar climates, likely to arrive in Scotland or already present here in captivity or in gardens. Overall, 52 experts contributed their time to review and score hundreds of potential species spanning terrestrial, freshwater and marine environments. Each species was scored on a scale of one to five for the likelihood of arrival, establishment and impact on biodiversity. The overall invasiveness score was calculated by multiplying the three scores together with a maximum score of 125. The experts discussed the scores and adjusted to rank the species within their area of expertise online. Then the UKCH held a plenary session to moderate the scores and reach a consensus on the overall ranking of species. In total, 17 species caught, uh, scored a maximum of uh, 125. From this list, a top 10 species were chosen for awareness raising across the different environments. The top 10 contains one marine mollusk, two freshwater mollusks, two freshwater plants, two terrestrial invertebrates, four terrestrial invertebrates and two terrestrial plants. Inns that are covered by existing contingency plans, such as the one for Gerdodactylus solaris, emerald ash borer and Asian hornet, were deliberately not included in the top 10. The next few slides describe how Scotland is dealing with the top 10 horizon scanning species. The slipper limpet arrived on the south coast of England in the late 1880s with oysters imported from North America. It's since spread and is now established as far north as Belfast Loch and the Humber. There have been a few reports of slipper limpet in Scotland, but none have been verified until recently. A shell collector found a tiny mature shells at uh, two locations on the Murray Firth, Covesey and Och. Uh, see the photo in the top left of this slide. The records were accepted by the Conchological Society in January 2024. Uh, it's too early to say whether these animals were transported into the area's larvae or bred locally. Uh, it is feasible to manage slipper limpets to reduce their impacts on oysters, mussels and other shellfish, although eradication is unlikely. Zebra mussel and quagga mussels have been combined on the list because they're, well, very similar stripy mussels. Uh, zebra mussels had a somewhat unusual status in Scotland. It was first recorded in 1833 in the Union Canal around Edinburgh and uh, Perth docks on the River Tay. It was present in the Union and Forth and Clyde canals up until the uh, 1970s, after which it seems to have died out due to poor water quality. Uh, quagga mussel is spreading rapidly in England since it was discovered in 2014. Both zebra and quagga mussels have been uh, intercepted on canal, a canal boat uh, before it entered the water in Scotland. Uh, the photo in the top uh, right shows uh, samples from that boat. Um, Asiatic clam appears to be particularly well adapted to spreading in UK waters. Along with the Gulf wedge crab clam, it may have played a part in the loss of the endangered Witham orb mussel in Lincolnshire. 
Floating pennyworth and parrot's feather have been removed from uh, their known locations in the wild in Scotland. Floating pennyworth was first recorded in a ditch at Rose Isle Forest in Murray in 2015. Uh, Forestry and Land Scotland removed the plant by hand between 2016 and 2018 and again in 2022. Uh, parrot's feather has been removed from a park in the north of Glasgow and a garden pond in Assent. However, both are likely to be growing in garden ponds elsewhere in Scotland. Muntjac and raccoon are mammals that are known to have escaped from captivity several times in Scotland. Uh, Nature Scott does not consider Muntjac to be established in Scotland. The small number of verified records are associated with recent escapes from captivity. The majority of unverified records that Nature Scott has investigated are likely to have been road deer. Four or five male raccoons escaped from the Black Isle Wildlife Park in December 2015. In early 2016, raccoons were spotted at various locations from the Black Isle and Easter Ross. The pho photographs here were taken 12 hours uh, for, from each other, uh, 20 miles apart, and are probably different animals. We think that these and other raccoons captured in the wild in Scotland were probably recent escapes. Non-native flatworms can move around with garden pot plants and landscaping and other materials. The four horizon scanning species have distinctive colours and markings compared to the established New Zealand flatworm, which is shown in the top left image. Most of these flatworms eat earthworms, which are uh, widely recognised as key ecosystem engineers. Therefore, these flatworms could indirectly affect soil structure, nutrient cycling, and ultimately plant communities. The brown Contikia flatworm, top left, has been recorded from a wooden airshire and uh, the gardens of Collinsey House. The yellow striped flatworm below eats spiders, wood lice, and insects. Their two terrestrial plants uh, are widely grown in cu cultivation, but are starting to spread into the wild in uh, Britain and Europe. Pheasant's tail is an ornamental grass from New Zealand that produces a dense thatch and a lot of seed. The concern is that it may alter uh, the fire regime of habitats where it becomes dominant in the future. It's been recorded in a variety of habitat niches in England and seeds freely in gardens in Edinburgh. Commercial varieties of blueberry have been begun to spread into pine woods and peatlands in Germany uh, and in the New Forest, although in some sites there it may have been planted. The seeds are spread by birds, which means that the potential for spread at a landscape scale is high. Blueberry is not able to self-pollinate, which may serve to limit its reproduction when po uh, populations are small. It's been included in the top 10 to raise awareness of its potential to spread and to form thickets and habitats of high biodiversity importance in Scotland, um, such as pine woods and um, uh, um, forest, forest bogs. We encourage people to report sighting visit of inns via the Scotland's Environment Web reporting portal on iRecord. However, some of the new horizon scanning species have yet to be added to the drop down lists. If this is the case, please record your sightings using the iRecord app or the main website. Uh, for more cryptic species, get in touch with the relevant recording society via the Biological Recording Centre. We will also check for records on INS Mapper, although again, not all the Scottish horizon scanning species are listed. Screenshot shows INS mapper being used to survey an outbreak of giant rhubarb, Gunnera tinctoria, and record uh, recent management work. We're starting to see this large lead Gunnera spread in the West Highlands, possibly a result of uh, milder winters. You can help us to keep Scotland Gunnera free by reporting any sightings of the plant growing in the wild to iRecord or on INS mapper. Please remember to write growing in the wild or growing outside garden in the comment section. Preventing the introduction of INS requires identifying how they might arrive and taking action to stop this happening. The method recommended by the Biological Convention on uh, Bio sorry, the Convention on Biological Diversity or CBD is to identify and prioritise pathways of introduction and spread. 
The panel on the left shows the CBD's classification of introduction pathways. The panel on the right is a graphical illustration of these pathways in action. Uh, introduction pathways are the main ways in which species are moved from uh, one location to another by human activities. These include both intentional releases and un unintended introductions, including escapes from captivity, contaminants on goods, or stowaways on vehicles and equipment. Colin Harrower at the UKCEH carried out the pathways analysis. This broadly followed the methodology used by the UK assessment by Olaf Bowie of the Non-Native Species Secretariat. Information on pathways associated with non-native species was gathered from two sources. Information on uh, species established in Scotland was gathered from the GB uh, Non-Native Species Information Portal or NSIP. This was further broken down in, uh, into all species established in Scotland and species established since 1950. And thirdly, for the horizon scanning species, the experts were asked to identify the likely pathways of arrival in Scotland. Each species could be associated with one or more pathways. Pathways were scored by four different methods, and then the pathways were ranked in order of importance. All of the established and horizon scanning species were scored using the first two methods. The total number of species associated with each path, uh, pathway and a weighted score depending on the number of pathways associated with each species. For the horizon scanning species, the pathways could be scored by a further two methods. Uh, the total biodiversity impact for the species associated with each pathway and the total invasiveness score for each uh, for each species associated with each pathway. Different combinations of species subset and scoring method were compared to see what difference these made to the order the pathways were ranked in. The species already established in Scotland produced similar ranked orders of pathways regardless of scoring method. Note the importance of pathways such as uh, aesthetic release, seed contamination and agricultural escapes reflect the dominance of plants in these lists. The horizon scanning species produced a significantly different ranked order of pathways which had more in common with the pathways associated with species established in Great Britain since 1950. These were used in the UK uh, pathways analysis. This isn't surprising because both methods used impact scores, or perhaps because many of our horizon species are recent arrivals in GB. Comparing across these three lists, there are similarities and differences. Horticulture escapes and hitchhikers on plants consistently came near the top of all the lists. Stowaways and fishing equipment was a similar position on horizon scanning and the GB list, but not on our established species list. Similarly, hull fouling and ballast water were present on both our lists, but lower than the GB list. Interestingly, uh, ornamental escape and pet escapes were higher on both our lists than the GB list, possibly due to the difference is in uh, pathways classification. Natural dispersal to Scotland from other parts of GB was seen as a risk for the horizon scanning species. This doesn't feature highly as a pathway of introduction for established species because the GB NSIP data was used. We can use this analysis of pathways to direct our efforts in different ways. For example, we're working with uh, governing bodies and industrial, uh, sorry, industry representative groups to develop GB pa pathways action plans or PAPs for priority pathways. The horticulture, angling, recreational boating and zoos PAPs have been signed off by the GB program board and are on the non-native species uh, secretariat website. Uh, DEFRA is due to consult on these uh, pathways actions plans in the near future. We're working with the Fisheries Management Scotland and Angling Scotland to develop a Scotland specific angling PAP. Uh, a PET pathways action plan is under development with the pet industry. Public awareness and biosecurity are a big part of these plans. Two existing campaigns, Check Clean Dry and Be Plant Wise, have good name recognition within respective sectors. 
a pet campaign is being developed, but it probably won't be called Be Pet Wise. We're also using uh, the pathways analysis to prioritise the work of the GB uh, INS inspectorate. 14 inspectors, including one based in Scotland, are carrying out visits to ports, commercial premises, zoos, angling boating events to establish uh, non-compliance rates. They will use this information to drive future awareness raising and enforcement campaigns to reduce risky behaviours. And finally, I'd like to end by thanking the project team and all the species experts who contributed their time to the horizon scanning study and analysis of pathways for spread of ends into Scotland. Without your expertise and knowledge, to, uh, the report to the Scottish Government would not have been possible. That's great. Have I stopped sharing? There we go. Yep, that's great. Thank you, Stan. That was brilliant. Um, I'm very interesting to see the comparison of pathways in Scotland to GB. Uh, yes, that's something that we will need to do uh, a bit more work on um, through the uh, Scottish Inns Action Group and uh, possibly in action under the forthcoming uh, uh, Scotland Inns Plan. Yep. Um, and yeah, a lot of the things that Stan talked about are on our website, so I'll put a link in the chat box so you can um, access the pathway action plans and then materials as well for Beeple Eyes and Check Clean Dry, lots of awareness raising materials. Um, yes, yeah, so we have time for some questions. Um, so if anyone has any, you can put them in the chat box or the Q&A. Um, you mentioned the inspector as well, Stan. Um, so we have a webinar tomorrow with um, a couple of the inspectors. So if anyone is interested in hearing more about their work, that is at 1 p.m. tomorrow, I think. A link to register for that is on the website as well. Yeah, I will have to uh, watch that myself to find out what their priorities are this year. Yeah, there should be um, an APHA science blog coming out later in the week i think on thursday as well with um from one of the other inspectors so talking about her work sort of a day in the life of an inspector so that should be interesting too well i think you might have included enough in your slides so people don't need ah here we go um are invasive species also an important route for novel pathogens hmm yeah that's a good question um uh yes for uh for plants because a lot of novel pathogens come in on uh garden or uh, tr uh tree material i mean some like ash uh die back certainly uh thought to come in on the wind um but uh yeah, there's um, a number of examples of invasive species that have uh, carry pathogens. So they, um, there's a, get it right, I think it's a rust fungus associated with um, uh, high bush blueberry, uh, which could inf uh, potentially infect um, our own, um, you know, blaeberries in Scotland, the vaccinium myrtleus. Um, and yeah, there's examples from animal health as well. Uh, the classic example, of course, is um, squirrel pox that's affecting uh, our red squirrels. And uh, yeah, unfortunately, we just had the first confirmed case of squirrel pox north of the uh, fourth. So um, that's one that we're uh, looking closely at to see if we can establish whether it's spreading and if possible contain the spread. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Um, there was a panel that showed Europe as having a really high level of established invasive species. Um, why is Europe so much higher than other areas? That's a good question. <laughs> uh, yes, I guess it's because of our habit of uh, creating empires and going out and collecting things and bringing them back. Um, <laughs> and also moving them around between different places <laughs> in the rest of the world as well. Um, yep. So, yeah, I guess it's because, uh, yeah, because we went out and coll uh, collected plants, brought them back for our gardens. And it's also uh, to do with the level of global trade and travel as well. Um, yeah, 
which is increasing all the time as well. So mm. an important priority. Um, do you know where where invasive plants such as Japanese knotweed can be disposed of in Scotland if in situ treatment or on-site burial is not a viable option? Um, yes, that was an interesting one for the uh, for, for, for the gunnery control to the weekend. Um, yeah, so really you should be doing it uh, on site and if you're taking it off site, you really need a, a waste transfer notice and it should go to a, um, a registered landfill site, um, which is expensive. So for small amounts, it's yeah doesn't really make a lot of sense, which is why in situ treatment or um, uh, on site burial is the preferred option. Um, for most situations, um, either in situ treatment or on site burial or storage should be possible. It's really if you're, it's re it should, should only be sending stuff to landfill if it's, uh, you know, a, a, a construction project that you know, has a tight deadline and needs to, you know, basically needs to clear the land and move on. That's when stuff has to be sent to landfill. Um, but yeah, there's, yeah, it's maybe a pathway that we need to look at more closely in Scotland is not just um, uh, invasive plant material associated with soil being moved around, but also um, invasive animals like New, New Zealand flatworm. Um, that can also be spread in uh, a contaminated topsoil. Yeah, thank you, Stan. Um, you mentioned a couple of apps for reporting INS. Uh, are these available to all, are you the general public or are they deaf or group only? No, no, they're, uh, they're available to everybody. Um, so the INS mapper was, was it supported by DEF? I'm not sure. It's, it's, um... it's had funding from um, a lot of different organizations i don't think yeah. it's had any from defra but yeah it's yeah, funded yeah. it's free so that, that, for that, users. that's the um that's certainly been promoted in england and wales as the uh, one of the main reporting portals uh in scotland we're um a, uh, we're being a little bit cautious and we're we're, we're uh we're sort of evaluating how effective it is and how useful it is before we start recommending it we're at the moment we're um recommending that people record uh via i record um uh, so there's a if the people want to go to Scotland's environment website and look at look for how to record invasive species there, uh, it will take you through a link to a uh, bespoke portal in I record that's got all our drop down lists for inns in Scotland, and uh, it also comes through to uh, myself and a few other um, inns experts in Scotland for verification too. So uh, in theory, we should find out about it uh, um, pretty quickly. Yeah, the first port of call in England is I record as well, just because you can record all non mm. species, so alert species, which you're particularly interested in. I think yeah. um, Insmapper is good for recording sort of widespread species, and it's great because you can record management as well. But yeah, if there's something that you're not sure mm. about, I record. Yeah, um, and the beauty, of, the beauty of I record too is that we can set up alerts so that we get notified automatically, and you know, an email into our inbox when a new species is uh, recorded in a particular area. Uh, that won't happen with Insmap until the uh, data is uploaded periodically into the NBN database, as far as I know. Um, but at the moment, there's not that many records in Scotland, so we can go in and search manually. <laughs> Um, OK, do you see an increasing role of detection dogs for invasives in Scotland? Um, yes, potentially. Um, certainly they're uh, being used uh, to good effect in the uh, Orkney Stoat project. Um, Nature Scots, uh, mink trappers in the Western Isles have been using dogs for a number of years. Um, and they're also being used in the uh, seabird um, by security surveillance work as well um, through through that project and uh, potentially we're also looking at uh, feasibility of using detection dogs to uh, identify um, active squirrel drays in Aberdeen as part of the uh, the, the eradication attempt to eradicate grey squirrels there. Um, for in surveillance and rapid response. I mean, yeah, I think dogs can be trained to um, a number of different scents, you know, so it's not just one 
target species that they can detect. I guess the tricky bit is that how does the dog tell you which target species it is? <laughs> Um, you know, it's, it's, it's one thing if it's detected, you know, it's trained to detect, um, you know, a range of different nar narcotic drugs. It points at the bag, you open the bag, you find the drug. But if you don't, with INS, if you don't know quite what you're looking for, that makes it that bit harder. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah. Um, OK, it's a couple in the chat box. Um, yes, yeah, so someone's asking if they can have a copy of the presentation. So it will, we'll upload a copy of the recording afterwards. Um, so that'll be available to people. Um, and then someone else asking if there's a recommended guidebook on invasive species or if it's best to use online resources. Um, one moment. <laughs> Not sure if this is still in, in print, but I would highly recommend uh, Invasive Plants and Animals in Britain by Olaf Boy, Max Weed and Helen Roy. Um, yeah, so I think um, that is out of print but um, you can print. still Is buy it? an well, e be, yeah you can get might, an e-book might be able to find good, good, good copy um so there's a a book uh, i've not ordered my copy yet but there was a a guide to um species of uh, plants of european concern in ireland that was uh published just last month um, so uh, if you go and look for that on the uh, Invasive Species Ireland's website, I'm sure that's very good. Um, and I'm going to I'm going to get one uh, a copy myself to help me with uh, uh, my invasive gunneras, trying to tell the difference between the uh, the the, the, the Ch Chilean giant rhubarb and the hybrid one, which I've been trying to get my head around. Yeah, and we have some um, ID sheets on our website as well for, I think, 60 species. So they're there. Um, if you're just looking for a kind of reminder of alert species or species of special concern, the plants and animals, we just um, released some new posters as well. Not with ID information, but just kind of as a visual reminder of what's on the list. Yeah, and I would also maybe add for some of the more cryptic species that are harder to identify, definitely get in touch with the um, this sort of relevant UK recording society uh, that you can find uh, uh, contact details for them on the um, uh, biological recording uh, uh, GB website. Yeah, that's very good advice. Um, OK, one last question. Are we seeing a shift focusing on prevention of invasive species rather than long term management or control? Um, I think, yeah, so I, I hope there will be more focus on um, prevention and rapid eradication than there has been in the past. Um, Hopefully not at the expense of long term management control. Uh, I think we've been quite good in Scotland at prioritising, you know, big projects that will have impact and I hope those will continue. But um, uh, sort of longer term, yeah, I think that's where the uh, biggest wins will be in the future if we can uh, try and so. Uh, a Great Britain level, um, it's an estimated two invasive species arrive and become established each year. Um, so that's um, uh, what tw 20 over a decade. So if we can half that um, over a decade, uh, then that's going to, you know, half our problem in the future potentially. So that's one of the most um, impactful ways that we can tackle inv invasive non-native species. So yes, that is where I would like to see more prioritisation going in the future. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Um, someone was asking if we could put in the names and authors of the field guides, but a um, couple of people have kindly done that already. So thank you for that. Um, I think that is all of the questions. I'll just check the chat box. Um, yeah. So I think that's everything. But yeah, thank you again, Stan, for a brilliant talk and some great answers to questions afterwards. Um, as I said, we'll share the recording um, online after the meeting. So if anyone wants to watch it back um, or share it with anyone else, then you can do. Um, and just a reminder that we have a few other webinars coming up this week. So um, check the website for those if you are interested. But yeah, thank you very much, Stan, and thanks everyone for your time today. Thank you very much for listening. Bye. Thanks, everyone.